Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. I'm sure you all know the story of how the last emperor of China was a mere six-year-old boy who was forced to abdicate after the Xinhai Revolution in 1912. But what happened to him after that? Though his throne was taken from him, that kid would grow up, long dreaming to reclaim his stolen throne. But in the end, though that dream would never quite be fulfilled, the last emperor of China would end up in the last place you, or he, would expect. So what happened to the last emperor of China? To answer that, we're gonna need to start at the beginning. The last emperor was a kid named Aizenjioro Puyi, and was born in the Prince Chun Mansion north of Beijing on February 7, 1906. At this point, China was under the rule of the Qing Dynasty in the reign of his uncle, the Guangxu Emperor. Or not. See, though Guangxu was technically the emperor, he didn't have any real control over, well, anyone. Instead, the country was in the hands of his aunt, the Empress Dowager Cixi. Cixi was originally a concubine of the Xianfeng Emperor, but after he died in 1861, his and Cixi's five-year-old son became the Tongzhi Emperor, and she, being the child emperor's mother, or Empress Dowager, gained incredible influence. But then, uh-oh, in 1875, at age 18, Tongzhi died of smallpox. Not to worry though, cause Cixi has more children she could put on the throne and control. This time being her three-year-old nephew who became the aforementioned Guangxu Emperor. But as he grew up, he got a little too reformy for her liking, so she staged a coup and took pretty much absolute control. But now, it's the early 1900s and Cixi is getting old. But Guangxu was still young. So, fearing that Guangxu would implement his reforms after she died, Guangxu was mysteriously poisoned on November 14th, 1908, and Cixi had to find another child to put on the throne. This time, her two-year-old great-nephew, Pu Yi. And then she died the next day. And so, the little Pu Yi was on the throne, crowned as the Xuantong Emperor, and as the Emperor, basically did whatever he wanted, including torturing his eunuchs. But, of course, as a child, he couldn't rule an empire, and so power instead fell into the hands of Empress Dowager Long Yu, Guangxu's former wife, whom Pu Yi absolutely despised. But wait a minute, the Chinese populace wasn't all that happy about not having reforms to the broken dynastic system and were fed up with being kicked around by foreign powers, so they became increasingly pissed at the Qing government for not doing anything about it. And so, in 1911, the Xinhai Revolution, led by Sun Yat-sen, broke out in order to overthrow the Qing dynasty. The revolutionaries negotiated with a powerful Qing general named Yuan Shikai in order to secure the abdication of Pu Yi in exchange for himself becoming president. And so Yuan would bring this to Long Yu, who would formally accept the abdication of Pu Yi on his behalf. Pu Yi was an emperor no longer. But for a while, he didn't even realize it. Pu Yi was allowed to stay in the Forbidden City and was given enough money and servants to live as an emperor for the rest of his life. But the only thing is, that was only inside the Forbidden City. He wasn't allowed to leave. What was once an imperial palace became nothing more than a prison, which is something he would need to get used to. As time went on, China descended into chaos as Yuan Shikai's government collapsed into regional warlords constantly feuding with each other for domination, and the Forbidden City would constantly be attacked. On one occasion in 1917, a warlord named Zhang Shun, a royalist, took over the palace and proclaimed an imperial restoration with Pu Yi back on the throne, until he was defeated by some other warlord 12 days later. Pu Yi would go on to marry not one, but two women, and receive tutelage from a Scottish man named Reginald Johnston. Johnston highly respected the traditional Chinese dynastic system and preferred it to the British system. And he would ultimately influence Pu Yi by pushing him into seeking his own restoration. 
Later on, in 1924, when Puyi was 18 years old, the Forbidden City would be attacked once again by a warlord named Feng Yuxiang, who this time decided to force Puyi out of the Forbidden City. But where the heck was he supposed to go? Puyi first stayed with his dad for a few days before Johnston reached out to several foreign embassies asking for refuge. But every single one of them declined except the Japanese, who gave Puyi refuge and let him move to some land they held in Tianjin not far from Beijing. Puyi would live in Tianjin for several years, essentially just living as a wealthy celebrity, calling himself Harry Puyi, inviting house guests and buying all sorts of expensive stuff. But in 1928, Chiang Kai-shek began pushing to reunify China. And during his campaigns, Kuomintang troops desecrated the burial site of old Qing emperors, which enraged Pu Yi. He held Qiang personally responsible, and as China had showed its hatred of him, he began to distance himself from his Chinese identity, identifying more closely with his ancestral homeland of Manchuria. Meanwhile, in 1931, Japan would invade Manchuria and set up a puppet state known as Manchu Kuo, but the state was seen by many as illegitimate. But wouldn't it be nice if there were some established Manchurian, say a deposed former emperor of China who sought his own restoration, who they could put in place as a puppet ruler and give legitimacy to their puppet state? Oh, there is? Great. The Japanese would use manipulative tactics to try to get Puyi to come to Manchu Kuo and assume the post of emperor, which against the wishes of his wife and close advisors, he accepted, leaving Tianjin for Manchuria, where he would eventually be crowned as Emperor of Manchu Kuo. But he was really only an emperor in name only. Puyi dreamed of being restored to the Qing throne and was willing to do anything to fulfill that dream, including working with the Japanese. But that was the last thing the Japanese wanted to allow to happen, and everyone, except himself, saw through the facade. Everyone, including Pu Yi's own dad, who called him a fool for not realizing this, saw that the Japanese were only using him, and that he didn't hold any real power, nor would the Japanese let him. Puyi would stubbornly remain in Manchu Kuo, though, desperately trying to rule for himself, but constantly being shut down by the Japanese Kwantung army. And in 1937, Japan would invade China, starting the Asian theater of World War II, with Puyi, not really having much of a choice, siding with Japan. Manchuria became a center of many of the brutal human experiments and dehydrations that Japan had committed throughout the war, and since they were done in Pu Yi's country, they were done under his name. That is, until, in 1945, the Russians invaded. In 1945, with the collapse of the Axis powers during World War II, the Soviets would invade Manchuria. And seeing the Russian advance, Puyi attempted to flee but was captured by Russian troops before he could make it out in time. And after being captured by the Russians, Puyi was tossed in a gulag. Due to his cooperation with Japan, China, both the Communists and Kuomintang, considered Puyi a traitor and Chiang Kai-shek wanted him shot. In 1946, Puyi was put on trial in the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, which was basically just the Japanese Nuremberg, and through a combination of lying as well as expressing how much he hated being only a puppet for the Japanese, was let out and sent back to the Gulag. In 1949, the communists defeated the Kuomintang and proclaimed the People's Republic of China, and Puyi was sent back. But, oh no, he wasn't going to be free, he was too important for that. Mao had other plans. Just like the Japanese, Mao saw Puyi as a useful pawn that could be used to legitimize his own regime. If he could get the former emperor of China to change his ways and endorse his government, this would solidify the view that his regime was the rightful Chinese government. And so, into the communist re-education camp he went. Puyi spent 10 years in a Chinese communist re-education camp, which saw him completely remolded into a communist. 
and it wasn't until 1959 that he was released and returned to Beijing. And being free for the first time in his life, the former emperor would visit his old home in the Forbidden City and would work as a street cleaner and a gardener for the rest of his life. In 1967, at the age of 61, Pu Yi would pass away, and with him, the last connection to China's ancient history. His whole life, Pu Yi was nothing but a pawn for those around him who wanted to use him to further their own agendas. He was used by Cixi, by the revolutionaries, by the warlords, by the Japanese, and then by the communists. And though he was born to wield power over everyone, he never had it over himself. He really was the last emperor of China. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also maybe subscribe or something. So that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.